Jefferson. So Jefferson Pinder, hello. Um, hey. Jefferson, Jefferson Pinder is a national and international award winning um, interdisciplinary artist. He's been featured in many solo and group shows, including exhibitions at the at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the National Gallery of Art, the Tate Modern. Um, Jefferson has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Move In Image Acquisition Award, uh, Award, and the Joyce Fellowship Award in, um, in the field of performance. Most recently in 2021, he was named the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow. In his work, Pinder applies his knowledge of music, imagery, and performance to address complex issues of race, ethnicity, and class. Jefferson Pinder received a BA in theater and a MFA in mixed media from University of Maryland. And he is currently a professor of sculpture at the School of Arts Institute of Chicago. So with that, I'd like to welcome Jefferson Pinder. Thank you very much. Hey, I hope good to see you again. Hello? Yes. Oh, okay. So you, would you like to- uh, presentation or should, should we- Just jump in? Yeah. Or you wanna chat a little? I chat a little. Um, I mean, maybe uh, you tell me a, a little bit about your program and- uh, and, and yeah, then I can move into my presentation. Yeah, so the, the program is a, is a design technology program as you, you were of in, in, um, at Parsons. And so we study the intersection of technology society. Um, and I think recently we've been, and, and, and part of that you know, is trying to move away from the sort of techno positive, 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 view of technology and sort of understand technology as something that is embedded in society and that, that you know that it's really really connected to um, societal issues so since the last few years you know it's been really really rough in terms of the issues of social justice and racism and etc cetera, etc cetera. and trying to understand what that means in terms of technology in terms of how you as a pra as praxis, how do you work against that? And so thinking of your work, we thought that your work fit perfectly with that. And that's why we have you here, invited you over. Thanks, I'm like the, the clumsy technology person, you know? It's, <laughs> but, you know, you know I, I think, you know, one of the things that I always say is that we have to adopt an inclusive, uh, uh, a capacious view of technology. Technology is not just about electrons and computers, right? Language is a technology. You know, the clothes that we wear are technologies. Um, so I think, you know, I don't, I wouldn't consider you the clumsy technologist. I would consider you someone that is utilizing technology in quite profound ways, um, especially, um, you know, media, video, uh, performance. And that's another thing, that the idea of, using the body as as a technology using the body as a means of yeah engaging with the world right yeah particular kind of mechanics it's so interesting that you say it because i was wondering earlier i was like you know i i talk about the body as a technology as a system something that we have to work through that it has intrinsic obstacles that we may not be aware of but we have to work through them and through that that process something is revealed um yeah. i feel like that has been a pleasure and pain of my career is that I've always felt like there were things that I wanted to do and I had to figure out how to make that happen. You know, like there are technologies that are at the cutting edge and I'll find one person who'll be like, yeah, I think I could be able to show you how to do that so you can make this work. Yeah. So on one hand, I'm like, I'm constantly, you know, learning about new things, but never like, delving into them with maybe the, the precision that somebody who is, you know, skilled in a field would. But, you know, I, I, I remember like after grad school running into this, you know, this seasoned, you know, uh, you know, former Yale grad school student. And he was saying to me, I was telling him how, 
how desperately I wanted to be a better, you know, renderer. I wanted to draw better. And he's like, why? And I was like, well, so I could be a, a better drawer. He's like, well, do you know what you need to know to be able to do what you need to do? And I remember he was like a couple years out of grad school, but it seemed like he gave me the freedom to not be the expert before I make the work. You know, because I think that's the idea is that we have to have a certain level of proficiency and some people do. But I think I'm lucky enough with, with my practice that, that, you know, sometimes the, the happy accidents is, is what makes the piece work and inevitably working through these technologies is inherent in the work. You see Jefferson struggle in the performance piece and also in, in the editing room to be able to figure out how to communicate that. And it's that struggle with the technology that becomes actually part of the work. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. That idea of, you know, I, I, I tell students um, a lot that, you know, focusing on one particular technology, you know, like being an expert in that. Yes, there, there are definitely um, possibilities in that, but I think it's more about learning to learn, right? Um, keeping in mind that different technologies at different times sort of come into the existence, you know, things fade and fade out. But if one learns to learn how to, how to use uh, media, how to use the, that material, how to use um, these technologies, then one, forever basically um has competency yeah yeah no that's that's wild it's like you know teaching a person how to work within systems and once you figure it Absolutely. out you can throw you any system in your way and you're gonna have to you know these are things that i'm sure that you're dealing with all the time but it, it's also great to be reminded that it's just because i think we're in the thick of it and we're going through like we're troubleshooting why something isn't working we're going through it again and again that somehow it's like you know good to know that it's this is all part of a larger thing that that we're not alone. And I mean, I think that's yeah. the opposite. We 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 like to believe because society tells us that artists work independently, but this these technologies are you know much better navigated when when we come together and and we help each other out because it's, yeah. I mean even if you're going through the same process on the eighth time, you need someone to say no, it's okay, do, do it eight, nine, ten, ten times. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think key is is process. You know, that's another that's another word. Of, you, you know, what is the what is the process that one goes through? How does one learn from that process? How does one learn from the mistakes that one makes during the process? Right, and I, for me anyway, sort of understanding systems, understanding process, to me seems a lot more, and understanding the context and uh, and concepts, right. Um, seems a lot more uh, generative, I think, than sort of focusing on something very particular in terms of uh, the tech. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to keep using the word technology, but it's, I, I think maybe techne, sort mm -hmm. of a particular mode of, sort of idiosyncratic mode of, of working or idiosyncratic um, material or, you know, one could think about, you could go deep with that, yes, and there's some, there's value there, uh, but you could also go sort of horizontally, right, and get something out of that as well. That's right, that's right, and I think that's, that's what we have to remind ourselves, that, that technology within an artistic process is like, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to know, I mean, of course, we want to say it's finished at this point, but I also think that there's a continual, you know, the, of, of learning that that doesn't end when you're done with the project, like we were saying early on, it's it's like what, what you carry with you. And how do you learn to explore these systems? And also, what do the systems tell us about ourselves? And within society? And how do we affect that? You know, it's like if, like, um, you know, recognition, race recognition on like, you know, your iPhone and, and how flawed it is. And, you know, we start thinking about like, the people who are disadvantaged by technology, who historically have been disadvantaged by technology, and we we call the cotton gen a technology. Who who who's that like disadvantage? Yeah. You know. So I'm I'm thinking of innovation comes at an expense. Yeah. And you're you're, you're, you're touching on on something that I you know that is, that's in your work that I'll love to for you to get at at some point, yeah. which is the um, that idea of the how bodies, especially black bodies are sort of displaced um, by particular technologies or sort of 
how 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 one uses the the body um, to reclaim some of that um, lost power as well. Yeah. 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 So do you want me to jump right into my work? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, please. Because I, I love this conversation. I mean, it you, is, you know, we could have this conversation forever. We, we absolutely could because yeah. it is kind of like. It's a lot more of a social conversation than people want to give it credit for. I think by separating these things, the, the social and the political from the technology, I mean, it's almost like you're advantaging that technology to dictate what society is, you Absolutely. know, rather than molding it. So let me see if I can do a presentation here. Okay. All right. So this is a piece from 2009, and I, I start this one. Uh, I start with this one because it, it seems like a, a rather benign silhouette um, in neon, white neon, of a person, and that person is me. Um, this is um, assimilated, and you have black charcoal that's at the bottom, and the black charcoal is representative of um, possibly a physical mass and accumulation of, of blackness that has just kind of fallen to, to the floor, and then this outline which is white. Well, I, you know, I thought this was kind of a tongue in cheek cute piece, but um, the curator at Arts and Embassies uh, took a liking to this piece and it ended up in Khartoum and ended up in the embassy in Sudan. And sometimes your work gets to travel and it travels further than you. But for in this one situation, I asked um, the curator if, if, you know, by chance, if there was an opportunity, if I could go to Khartoum, I'd love to. And she was like, well, I don't know, I, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's an expensive ticket, it's to the government, blah, blah, blah. Well, to make a long story short, um, they put this up, which is just almost like the strangest piece that anybody would want to necessarily put in an embassy in, in Africa, but they, they, they put it in the embassy and I was happy. And, and there were a lot of people who complained about it. They thought that it was a representation of them and when I said uh, when I said that this is assimilated, they said um, the people who worked in the embassy who were from Sudan said this is a representation of us and we don't like it. Take it down. And I was like, and lo and behold, the curator calls me up and says, "Come on in. We we want you to come to Khartoum. We want you to talk about your piece." And so I did, and and we went on a tour with through the community. We talked about the piece. I'm like, "This is me. This is my perception within Western society." Blah blah. And then within like two weeks after me leaving, someone had tore it down wow. and destroyed it. And I, I, I mentioned this because this is probably one of my best success stories because it's, it's somehow the work is, is evoking a response. I mean, somebody is willing to go to jail to tear down my piece in a US embassy because that is government property at that point, but that they, they just did not like the action or the words or the associations to the point that, that they wanted to, to break the piece. And they wanted to destroy it, um, which is a very, really easy thing to do with neon. But I wanted to start with that because I, I don't know why. Somehow I think about technology and I, th I think about um, using that older technology, the white neon, to evoke an emotion. And, and somehow across the globe, somebody gets it. You know, for some strange reason, we connect without even meeting. The work is speaking to them in a way that they're sympathetic to me and they're sympathetic to themselves to the point that they don't want a reminder of what assimilation is. And so that that's a success piece from 2009. I got, I'm going to try to show you a little bit of um, kind of how I, I, I came about in my process. I'm a performance artist. Um, as much as, as I dabble with a lot of other things, it is to try to catch that moment and to capture that moment. And I use technology to capture these incredible moments that I have on stage um, or in these performances that are fleeting, that, you know, and, and I don't know if I've ever really been able to do it justice, but I think I create representations of the thing. Um, so what I deal with is, is three things. One, is the performance. Two is the documentation of that performance. And three is the manipulation of the documentation of the performance. So then it becomes almost, it could be almost like something completely different with that manipulation, that editing. And then if it's a straight shot, the documentation is the thing. Um, so working within that, you know, that's, that's, 
you know, as much as I'm saying, I, you know, I'm a performance artist, it is the museums and the galleries that if they like the work and they want to purchase it quickly, I find myself in a technology mindset where I'm trying to think, how will this live into the future? How will my work be preserved for future generations? Well, this is um, you know, one of my my inspirations, and I show him because uh, he's all about biomechanics and the, the you seeing the body as as part of the machine. Let's see if I can advance this. I'm having a hard time. There it is. Yeah, he was, uh, this guy's name is Meyerhold, Vesvold Meyerhold, and he was a theater practitioner that um, mirrored Stanislavski, and he believed that the body was, was not only the instrument and tool, but could be a weapon for society, for social change. That if you stress the body enough, or if you work that body so it's familiar with particular poses, that in that moment that you're on stage and you're performing, you can put yourself in a physical pose that can evoke an emotional response. That somehow like getting your body and putting it in particular positions um, can enable that you never have to fake it on stage because your body is gonna dictate what that mood is. And this is something that was really heavy for me early on, especially my earlier works is like, how do you begin to, to take a group of people and work them together as a team you know, Vesfold Meyerhold didn't believe that there should be a protagonist and an antagonist, a lead character on stage, a, a pretty ingenue, uh, you know, a handsome leading man. He was like, that's bullshit. Everybody needs to work on stage as one machine, one body, and that everyone should wear a uniform, um, that together their uniforms could create this mechanism that could be more powerful together than the individual pieces. So that, yeah, you might think that the leading person is, is an attractive individual, but ultimately what you wanna do in that moment where you have an audience and the spectators present, you wanna create an experience that's spiritual. That somehow everyone is working together that you get chills on your back because it's like, um, it's like uh, maybe watching a sporting game when you're watching athletes that don't have to necessarily know where each other at because they they just have, they played together so long that they can just pass the ball and know someone's going to be there. This is what we're talking about with the arts, and this is the work of of Meyerhold. Um, I, I could go on and on. I could spend all my time talking about him, but I think what's important to mention is that um, his practices were were revolutionary. Revolution they were used for the state in the Second Revolution and and. Um, the Soviet Union, he was criticized because his stuff was not social enough. It wasn't uh, Soviet enough. It wasn't uh, a tool for, it wasn't a propaganda tool. As, as socialist as it is, it wasn't a tool for propaganda. And eventually he found himself um, in jail. He went home one day and his wife was killed. Um, he was put in jail again and he died there. I mean, so. Sometimes we're like, well, what, is, what are the stakes? Well, the stakes can be really high for innovative work. And he was on the cutting edge. So enter, you know, what happens with when black nationalism combines with this Eastern European idea of the body as a machine or the body going through the motion so that you can evoke a response. So it started for me early in, in 2003 with films, just kind of doing Herculean tasks. Usually I would go through it myself. I would go through the process of um, taking a heavy object and, and carrying it along weight. Again, it was the technology came into the picture with how is that, how are you gonna capture that moment? And how are you gonna do justice carrying a heavy weight or pulling a heavy weight in this case through a Baltimore street when, when nobody is there? How do you preserve that? Um, and this is a, a question that many performance artists ask themselves is like how, you know, do you capture drudgery? How do you capture pain? I mean, it's like, it, there's a thin line. I mean, uh, uh, between there being a display of drudgery and actually there being that pain and in, in, in that intention of, of trying to do something that's absurd or Herculean. So um, I called it the inertia cycle and it dealt with this. But then later on, um, I began to like, um, to jump into other work. And, and the work is, is kind of dramatic in nature, um, almost to the point where capturing it is, is one of the most important things because I don't know if I could do the work again. I think I realized that with myself, 
and some of the risks that I'm taking, I can do it once. That doing it twice, I mean, is really pushing it. I mean, and I, you know, I, I guess I wanted to title this presentation the pieces that I can never do again. And this was going to be one of them, which is the escape artist. Um, I think that that some of, um, like I was saying earlier to Io, that some of what I do and what I love about what I do is um, is that I have to figure it out in the moment. And sometimes it's not always the way that you figure out these problems in a practical way. But there's a way. They're more or less a representation of, a, of how an artist tackles a problem and how an artist tackles risks. And sometimes this could be in opposition with um, putting yourself in bodily harm. Um, this one was wasn't as much harm as it as it was awkwardness. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, escape artists, and in particular how escape artists are trained to break free of holes and how a generation of African-Americans could be trained to be escape artists and, and how empowering they could be if people could learn how to break free of a hold. Um, simultaneously, I was also thinking about um, the last person who was lynched in, in my state of Maryland was lynched, on, um, is in, lynched in December 1931 and it was an 80th year anniversary. So I was trying to make these things collide to the point where <clears throat> if I was, suspended in this straitjacket like Matthew Williams was in 1931, could I change the history by figuring out how to get out of that hold? Um, part of the reason that I don't think I'll do it again is, is because I, it, it, I think eventually there's, there is a evolution in which I would get better and better at it. But I think there is almost a, a, a little bit of terror and going through this for the first time in the moment that someone was killed exactly 80 years to the day. So it's like the convergence of social issues and um, performance art. And again, you know, using uh, audio track technology um, to somehow enhance that moment and to carry it on so that it's preserved. Um, this is Ben Hur from 2015, and this is loosely based on the Charlton Heston movie in which you have black bodies moving a slave ship in space. I mean, not in outer space, but moving it through the ocean, <laughs> even though that would be pretty badass. Um, these are six performers whose task is to stay on these water rower machines and to move the water around and eventually um, keep this action going until the machine breaks down, until um, the very best of the performers who have the best form that may not have the stamina, but do it the best, they start breaking down and the whole machine start, the human machine starts collapsing. And once that human machine collapses, you then you, you, you start um, understanding what failure looks like and, and there's something about it that is that it, that's unpredictable and can't can't be determined. Who is going to be the one who's going to be the last one on the machine? Because then it goes from being a choreographed piece where everybody is moving in sequence to the machines start breaking down to every man for himself. Who is going to be the survivor? And inevitably it was, it was always kind of, it was based on like things that, well, you could predict like the, the person who was most youthful and maybe had a particular kind of energy might be able to stay on the machine for longer. But what you couldn't predict is that the person with the best form was the one who was one of the first people to, to quit first because he was the best rower and it was harder for him to accomplish. So these are some of the things that we're thinking about. And, you know, all of these machines are coordinated so that it's a, it's a manual um, a mechanical theater of a sort in which you're actually hearing the water rushing. Um, you're seeing the work that's happening. You're seeing this machine work together, but it's a human machine. I'm gonna play a little bit, a little bit if I can and see if everybody can hear. Yesterday, uh, it, was, uh, it was a day in which I did absolutely nothing. If anybody asked me what I was doing, I would have said creating a hell of an easy
for the sake of time, I'm gonna have to push forward. But what you can see is that they almost orderly get on the machines. And this is a little bit what I'm talking to you about, about capturing this moment so that you can film it as, as, as well as you can, but can you capture that precision, the energy, the intensity? This is what I work to do. it's also the monotony of the action that conveys the drudgery and time. show let's see if I can um, continue but that that was Ben Hur I just wanted to give you an idea of, of the kind of, of effort that I'm talking about um, similar happened with this piece thoroughbred which happened in two two years later which was a, a, a team of, of performers on treadmills that are all controlled together remotely um, using uh, a formula I found, found online on how to actually to to take over the, the motherboard of, of these um, these exercise, uh, we call it the mills. And then I could control it through remote, remote control. So what happens is I have four performers that are on treadmills and gradually I'm increasing the pace of the performance until uh, they're moving at um, a rate that, that, that you would imagine wouldn't be one that, that you could keep up. So you have four performers in the nude um, that are working themselves until the only option they have is to stop. They could stop just similar to, to Ben-Hur. It's like you have that one option is to quit. But until then, it's like we wanna see you work and, and, and work through that. Um, it's not often that we actually get the opportunity to watch people exert themselves. So meanwhile, the the audience, the spectators can have their wine, can eat their cheese, have a drink. While these performers, brown and black bodies are working themselves until there's, there's nothing left. So that, that's a little bit of the dichotomy I'm working at. And it's, it's blunt. It's, it's like blunt as a, you know, if I smack in the face with two by four, but at, at the same time, it, I, I think it's unique for the gallery space. Okay, so fast forward. We had a lot of other projects that I've worked with. I want to give us time to talk because I, I think there's only a couple of people here and I, I want to make sure that we have a chance to hear from, from everyone. Um, you know, I, I, I began this presentation with, well, there, there's some work that I've done that would be hard to do again. And I, I guess I, I would want to, to end the presentation with two of these pieces. 
Um, one which came about through um, the Red Summer Road Trip, which I did in, in 19 or, or 2019, which is a hundred year anniversary of the 1919 uh, uprising that happened in Chicago and in many other cities in the United States. I began to think, how do people train themselves for revolution? How do they train themselves for conflict? Um, so we started delving into um, Black Panthers, um, understanding the, the deacons for defense. Um, what would happen when blacks were trained by the military? They went off to war and they came back. You know, it's like they weren't the same individuals and they read, they led a civilian population um, for unrest. I mean, this has consistently happened. But I also wanted to think about um, if I can skip along. Um, a more tranquil and peaceful response to violence, uh, which is um, my float piece, which is a piece which uh, I used over 100 inner tubes and put 100 participants in Lake Michigan and had them float in a location where a young man was killed 100 years to that day um, in the same spot when he drifted into a white section of the beach uh, that was considered to be the Irish section and was hit in the head with a brick. Um, he sank into the water and it sparked five days of some of the bloodiest uh, uprising in American history in the city of Chicago. So how do you commemorate that 100 years later? Is we'll get 100 people in the water where he was at, where Eugene Williams was at and where he was killed and try to see if we together can float and what was interesting about the piece is that uh, the lake quickly told us about or taught us a lesson about how water moves. And even though we had situated ourselves in one part quickly, we found ourselves drifting into the, into the larger lake. And as much as the piece was about staying situated, we also quickly understand how quickly you can start in one location and end up in another. And this is a piece that not only could I not do again because the city of Chicago does not allow flotational devices in the lake. It is illegal. You cannot do it. They, they allowed us to do it that one day. But we understood why, because, because that lake is powerful. And you could start off in one place and you can end up in another, which is exactly what happened to Eugene Williams. But I, th I think what was really wonderful about this day is that we all were able to come together. And despite difference, differences, we were able to do something that wasn't possible 100 years ago which is as simple as, as sitting in, in the lake and, 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 and sharing in the connectiveness. So that was um, the float piece and that happened in 2019. And fast forward, I'm going through all this other stuff to a piece prowl. And I'm gonna just quickly talk about that. Um, there we go. Prowl um, was a performance piece uh, that I did last year in September in which we identified a neighborhood which is called Mount Greenwood where many police officers traditionally have lived. And we assembled a group of 20 people in cars and we slowly drove through that neighborhood at night. And we circled the neighborhood for about an hour and a half. Um, uh, we, we were surrounded by police, the police choppers were flying overhead. Um, this is another piece I don't think I could do again because I think that they would be ready for us next time, a little bit more so than they were in, in, our, in last, last year when we did it in September. But the whole idea was, well, how did the police feel when we create a route around their neighborhood um, where they live and drive slow and you know, with no disruption, with nothing more than that, the simplicity is we're just getting in our cars and we're driving through your neighborhood and we're gonna circle in your neighborhood for two hours. Uh, I tell you, at the end of that performance, um, we had to stop because if we didn't stop, we would have been arrested. And I think that's where the line is between an activist and an artist. I think if I was an activist, I would have, we would have been sp spending the night in jail. But as an artist, uh, you know, I wanted to, to be able to go home that night, you know, and think about how to edit the piece. 
And I, you know, I, and I think that to me, um, when people are like, oh, you're an activist, I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm so glad you think so. But the truth of the matter is an, an, an activist is going to attempt the problem differently. And if I was an activist and they knew I was an activist, there was no way they were going to let me into that space. But as an artist, they don't quite know what that is. And I was allowed into that space as an artist because they knew they had to let me into that space. But if it was a protest, they would have shut me out. And we would have never finished that piece at night. So I think sometimes it's okay to call yourself something other than what everybody else wants to call you because th that very well may give you that slippage or agency to be able to do more effective work. So I guess that's that's my 20 minutes, Io. Um, do you have any any thoughts? Do you? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jefferson. Um, yes, this that was that was great. Um, some of those pieces I haven't I haven't seen. Others I I know quite well. Um, I think I'm going to, um, I'd like to open it up um, for folks to, to ask questions. Any, anyone? Into the void. <laughs> I, I have one. Um, it, it's about this, um, that idea, that that line that you talk about between activism and being an artist. You know, it's almost, I don't know how to say it, like how much do you give of yourself? You know, you say, yeah, you're not an activist, but yet some of those pieces, some other people would have stopped before you know, um, and yet others would just have the idea in their mind and actually not make something, right? Um, so I don't know if I necessarily, I hear what you're saying about the, the, that line between the activists, right? But also some activists might stop at a certain point, others might go, you know, beyond. And I guess that comes to that question of, you know, you, your work is about the body, it's about exhaustion, it's about, sort of given it all, at what point is, what point is enough, mm -hmm. you know? Even if you were an activist, you get arrested once, you get arrested twice, right? Do you, does it need, do you need to waste the body? You know, is there, is there, is there a, a need to, for, for the, for the work to consume all of the body before it be like wh wh where is that limit i love that i that question because it, it's it's there's something about it in its nature is is humanitarian and ethical you know and and for you to be asking me that question i mean all the i mean all the presentation i've given no one's ever really said well what about like where is that line what about the performers you know um for me, I think it's where, where the brutality comes into it, it, that somehow I feel like even within the performances, my fear is, is that it, there, there's like a presentation of effort versus the reality, you know? And, and that's where I'm afraid of getting caught up. So sometimes I feel like I take it too far. Um, maybe not in the legal sense, <laughs> you know, in the legal sense, I don't know. I'm in that gray area, right? What I can get, what I feel like I can get away with, but if I don't feel like I can get away with it, I won't do it. Which is, you know, maybe this is where it's like, you know, this is the art therapy session. I was, <laughs> I was opening it up, but to be honest, I mean, I just think that there's just, um, with my pieces, I always wonder the opposite. I'm like, I haven't taken it far enough. I mean, it's just like, you know, did you just stop? What program, I mean, was that a mental or a physical thing? Like, for example, I would notice that in the performances, every once in a while I'd have an individual that, that would want to let somebody else win. Because for whatever reason, they didn't want to be that one. And I find that fascinating. You know, I think it, it is, and it, but, but at the same time, I mean, I give that person an earful and I'm like, no, your intention isn't to like, let somebody else take this. Your intention is to work until, you know, there's nothing left. But somehow within these processes, there is charity, there is humanity. 
there are moments that are like, yeah, like when, you know, um, that person says to the other person, no, I want you to, to take it because I don't want to be that one that's the last one standing. That's where the work gets infinitely more complex and that's in the process. And it's trying to figure out how to capture that. Um, but no, I, I, I think it's such a great question because I, I, I really, I wonder somehow how all of this has is, is changed me as an artist, as an individual working within these systems, how sometimes I, I, I forget about the, in, you know, the performer. I'm thinking more about the, you know, what I'm trying to communicate. Um, but no, I never felt like I, I pushed it too much, but I think it's easy for me to say that because I'm not always the one I'm pushing. Yeah. I, I have another question. Um, oh, what was it? It was just in my mind. Oh. Oh, yeah. Could you, could you, um, because uh, for students, could you run us through, let's say, um, thoroughbred, the process of from conceptualization or from ideation to like to the final piece? Like, how how do you go about doing that? Like, where do you get the money? You know, like if things fall apart, like how do you get? Uh, so who says okay, Jefferson? Let's have the piece. You know, do you do a debrief afterwards? Like from the beginning. Like if you could quickly just like outline so that students understand that you have some idea and this is how you might be able to push it forward. Sure, and and, and this is great. I'm lifting the hood. Um, so, uh, really accomplished, uh, dynamic artist pair from Chicago asked me to be in in this program. You know with no money, no nothing. All I know is that they were like in the nineties, probably some of the, the best artists in Chicago making great work. And they're like, hey, you know, we, we like you. You got a little something, Jefferson. Why don't you join our program? I had I had no money, no support. And this is weird because a lot of times we think that some of the toughest situations come from curators that you don't know. <laughs> Usually it's like the ones that you do know that you kind of like have some kind of personal connection to and you'll find yourself in a situation where you're really challenged. Um, I wanted to create something. I had very little time. I was thinking a lot about Ben-Hur, which I'd done a few years earlier, but I wanted the evolution of it. Something that I, in, in, in some way I, I can show like my control over the work. And the remote control aspect was what I had at first the hardest problems with because I was like, how am I gonna you know, control all of these devices together, but there was somebody who had like something online about a lathe that you could use one of these tr treadmills to create a lathe. And it was a formula of how to use a raspberry to connect it to some wiring, you know, and to the controllers to be able to control each individual speed of the treadmill. So that was like, it, it was wonderful. I had a, um, someone who works for our technology uh, program at SAIC walked me through um, how to make it happen. But once then we had the technology of how to make it happen, then they need to recruit the individuals. And one of the biggest things that I did that I regret is that I recruited folks at the, and then had a rehearsal process in which they practiced together. And when they practiced together, they learned from each other and they bonded, which makes it harder for them to say, no, no, you work so hard, you deserve to be the last one on the treadmill, which is just completely like, if I did this again, I would want like University of Chicago economic students or law students to be on that treadmill because I bet you they wouldn't be showing that kind of empathy. And I wouldn't have them meet each other beforehand. I'd have them come in the day of and, and, to, and to work it out. But I love rehearsal. And and so we, so you're like, well, how did you get to treadmills? I, um, I bought them all from Walmart. And then the day after the performance, I returned them all. Um, I mean, Walmart's good for it, right? I mean, they can, they can afford it. They can figure out how to, how to put it back into a box. Um, so that's how I, I, I was able to do it. I think the, one of the most expensive things was getting to U-Haul and moving the treadmills to the space. But what we'd had is a rehearsal process that lasted for about a week and a half where we trained together. And what happens when you train together, you bond. And I think that's the beautiful part that I love, but I, at, you know, 
now three years after, four years after, I'm like, no, I don't want them to bond. You know, I think the bonding somehow gets in the way of them like performing a task, which is kind of brutal. And I think in these moments, you see their, you see a hundred years history in their bodies. Um, guy, his, he was a smoker. And I swear to God, he was the most interesting guy to watch on the treadmill. It was like he, every fiber was trying to control. You know, when you're watching the, the train marathon runner, it's not very interesting, but you watch some guy who smoked two packs the day before trying to control his body on the treadmill and try to keep on that machine. It's, it's heroic. It's heroic. Um, so I think that's, those are the moments that I really like. Um, and I think sometimes they're, they're, they're really apparent. Um, I think one of the things I didn't anticipate is the audience was never really happy with me at the end of this piece. And um, as the artist, it always like took me a second to realize I'm an artist. This is like the great thing that I'm getting to think about. But also they saw me as a person who's inflicting pain on these performers. And as the one who was the man in this performance piece who was driving these performance to exhaustion. And again, almost like the piece being destroyed in cartoon, there's something that I kind of smile with half of my mouth. It's like, yeah, hate me. You know, you're feeling something. Uh, it's better that than just walk out the room and just, you know, scratching your head. They're, they're feeling something. Um, if I, and I, when I remember when I came out, the, the applause was was mellow. But when the, the performers came out, they just erupted because they knew that they had gone through something that was kind of special. So I guess that's the beginning to the end of Thoroughbred. Um, but usually they kind of have a little bit of chance and luck and things have Usually if, if I'm taking a risk, you know, I don't know how it's going to end until that moment, um, which is exciting. But at the same time, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think these pieces can fall flat um, because of that improvisation. Like in particular, the float piece that I did in the lake, I mean, I don't think it fell flat, <laughs> but it wasn't what I expected. You know, it wasn't expecting to tow people from, from, you know, the middle of the lake to bring them back because <laughs> they were quickly finding themselves flowing into Indiana. But yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Jefferson. Oh, uh, I just want to give an opportunity for anybody else um, that might have a question or comment. I, I had a quick one. Um, hi. Thank you so much, Jefferson, for your for your talk. Um, I was I was interested when you said that there were, you know, I'm gonna miss quote you, so uh, you'll have to correct me, but there were the performances, you documented the performances, and then you could manipulate the documentation in such a way sometimes that it became another thing. And I probably said that wrong, I apologize. There was something when you said it became another thing that I found really intriguing. Was there, was there ever a time when you took the documentation and you worked with it and you understood the piece differently for yourself. You saw or you found or you excavated some other meaning out of the piece through your manipulation that maybe you wouldn't have, maybe you wouldn't have noticed just as a bystander or as well as the artist who designed it or a bystander or the person who just took the straight documentation. Did the manipulation ever give you any new insight? Yeah. That's what a great question, because that is it. I mean, really, that is it. I mean, somehow you, you have an idea of what the essence of the work is. And then the performance happened and all these like brilliant things happen, but you almost have to keep your eyes on the prize and, and, and trying to figure out like, how can I communicate that thing? Um, for example, I was doing this piece called The Star of Ethiopia, which is a, a pageant by W.E.B. Du Bois about the 10,000 year history of black people that he did in 1911, okay? I mean, this blows you away. You just don't see Du Bois as a creative person until you read The Star of Ethiopia. I'm filming this with my team in the middle of, of a abandoned neighborhood in, in Chicago. And she's holding a flaming sword which is a hazard, right? <laughs> you know, anybody who's carrying something, I mean, it's, it looks great in film, but in that moment, there's me, there's a camera person, there's someone who's holding a ret flame retardant blanket and somebody who's pushing the dolly around so that we can do a circular motion around this woman holding 
a flaming sword. There's nothing that I could capture <laughs> that could capture that moment of us creeping around her in the middle of the west side of Chicago in the middle of the night. And I, you know, all, you know, a lot of times I, I mean, part of the reason that I'm really gotten, gotten interested in, in capturing performance is because I've noticed the making is a performance. And, the, and that's something that's over, over time I've learned that the making is, is sometimes is infinitely more dynamic and speaks volumes of that moment more than whatever is captured in the camera. And what happens is, is, is those, that information informs you and you wanna stay in the moment but it's never exactly which, the way you planned it to be. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it because when it does come close to being what I thought it would be, it's always a little boring. Um, so the manipulation is, is a tricky part because that's where you can lose the integrity, right? I mean, it's just like, man, you, you could make it into like a, a, a three minute music video that's so sexy and cool, but doesn't, doesn't get to that essence. So it's almost like fighting the temptation for the easier choices and also fighting together all the different conditioning that we've experienced when we watch a music video and of how something is supposed to unravel. Um, I think that's maybe something that as is even as a theater person, I'm even more aware of is, is like, how can you manipulate that without taking it too far? And sometimes they do. I mean, it's just, I mean, and, and that stuff. And the hard part is when I, I feel like I, I wasn't able to hit the mark with it and you know in a Kanye West technological world where I can just keep correcting the tracks over and over again maybe I can keep working on these pieces but then again you're not feeling the same way two years later you're just not it becomes something I've, I've tried to do that before so I think you you have a shot to, to get it right but it also it's like where is your mind and where is your head and this kind of goes back to your original question that once you start deviating from or going from that place it's easier for you to be able to lose your integrity with, with, with the representation of the work. And I think all of those stages can be interesting. I mean, if you think of Chris Burden, you know, his, his you know, shot piece where he gets shot in the gallery and it's 10 seconds of the most dynamic documentation that you could imagine, you know, two 20 something year olds in the college gallery and one has a rifle and is shooting another one. It's just like in, in 10 seconds has become possibly, you know, some of the most iconic documentation and there was no, nothing it's barely even there when you look at the footage it's like black moment black and white moment black moment and some text and that's it so it's just trying to identify what you have and the power of what you have um but i, I unfortunately i'm still unraveling it with the work i mean i wish i could say i had like the recipe of how to capture something but i mean it's it's very much in the moment but it, what a brilliant question so thank you melanie Thank you so much, Jefferson. Um, really, really appreciate it. I think on that, we're gonna wrap wrap up and um, it's been lovely having you. And yes, we still, you and I still need to, you know, talk another stuff later, um, but it's it's always great seeing you. Yeah, man, talk about duration work. I hope, I hope everything's going well over there in Parsons. I, you know, I admire you. I'm, I'm a huge fan of your work, Io, and I'm always like so so honored to be able to to spend time and talk shop with you. It was great to talk with you this afternoon. I wish I wish we'd recorded that, but yeah, you know, that was a, that was a good talk too. Yeah, next time. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. My pleasure. See you. Yeah. Thank you.